Okay, folks, we are at 7.05 and we have about 20 people signed on and we are excited to have you here. My name is Jenny Villa. I am currently a general board member on the AADC Board of Directors. Kind of think for a second there. Um, and it is my honor to be here to moderate for my friend Tynesha Coleman tonight for tonight's AADC Smart Talk. And just a brief introduction, Smart Talks were launched in 2018 as part of the AADC's Women's Lifelong Learning Initiative. Talks are presented by alumni and friends sharing from their professional expertise. Well-received talks have been presented in honor of Black History Month, about genealogy, managing college debt, owning your worth as a woman, the ABCs of Medicare, how women sued a major publisher for discrimination, and online reselling. Tonight, we are going to hear, as I mentioned, from Tynesha Coleman, and I'll introduce her and her bio in just a second, um, but we're going to let her talk for about a half an hour, and then we are going to open it up for questions and comments. I will be moderating that in the chat as we go along and um, doing that at, all at the end, unless Tynesha happens to see them and wants to pop in as we go along. Um, and you can put your questions and comments in the chat box, or at the end, you can raise your hand to be identified. Um, let me see here. I think that is it for those housekeeping rules. And to, uh, like I said, it is an honor to be asked to moderate here for Tynesha. I have been friends with her for a few years here, um, starting with the uh, AADC Book Club, which I believe started as the Black Alumni Book Club, um, but then was opened up to everybody. And it has been uh, a great experience. So if you're not already part of our Sisterhood Book Club or any of our other groups, please join. Uh, so to introduce Tynesha, Tynesha Coleman is a dynamic force in both academia and community service and has an impressive legacy as a former AADC Board of Directors member. As the current leader um, steering the AADC Sisterhood Book Club, Tynesha doesn't just facilitate discussions, she orchestrates meaningful connections and intellectual exploration. She previously served as the chair of the AADC Lectures Committee. During the AADC's 100th anniversary, she led the Community Service community Committee's successful AADC Helping Women period service project to provide menstrual products to people in need. Tynesha's impact extends far beyond her AADC contributions. As the CEO and founder of Exalt, Exalt Consulting, a boutique professional services form, for, excuse me, firm that helps organizations create a steady stream of ready now leaders. She is also a higher education executive at Rutgers University, where she develops strategic programs spanning faculty development and diversity, equity, and inclusion. She has a master's degree in city and regional planning, a bachelor's degree in urban studies from Rutgers University, Douglas, of course, and multiple certifications in leadership coaching, inclusive and ethical leadership, and organizational leadership. Tanisha is passionate about bringing out the best in people and fostering inclusive and respectful environments. So, Tanisha, I hand the floor to you, my friend. Let me just unmute myself or I will be talking into a void. Um, thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate your, your kind words and introduction. So I'm going to share my screen because I do have slides. And just thumbs up that you can see them so I can. All right. Awesome. So tonight um, I was asked to talk about empowering versus overpowering in the workplace. And um, this is actually a topic that is really near and dear to me for a couple of reasons. One, because of my work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then two, um, really just because I am a leader that strives to maintain um, environments where people feel empowered and, and really love to see other people do that as well. So before we get started, if my mouse will let me click. Ah, there we go. All right, so before I, I jump into all of the content, I want you to just take a step back for a moment. And just, if you wanna close your eyes, if you're a visualizer, close your eyes. If not, fine. Um, but I'm just gonna just play a scenario for you so that you can sort of get into the headspace of, of what this is all about. So I want you to imagine yourself as a dedicated team member. You're excited to contribute to a project with your colleagues. Your team is gathering information, they're brainstorming ideas, 
There's a sense of real camaraderie and collaboration. You feel like your suggestions are met with enthusiasm and it feels like your input is valued. And the same for your colleagues across the board, right? This is where you are now. But as the project progresses, you notice just a shift in dynamics. The leader of the project starts to dominate the decision-making process, leaving little room for in from input for others. And now your ideas seem to be disregarded and the once vibrant energy of the team starts to fade. And now what you notice is what started as a promising venture now feels like an uphill battle against suffocating control. And it's really hindering your ability to contribute effectively to this project, right? And so if you can picture that and sit in the emotions of that and the frustrations of being in that role, this highlights the challenges of balancing empowerment and control in the workplace. And if that balance is not really kept right, it leads to dwindling motivation and a sense of disconnection from the team. And so what this really illustrates is, you know, the reminder that a culture where people's contributions are valued and empowerment is balanced with collaboration and when there's control necessary, there's a balance. It really creates an environment where the entire team can thrive. So let me go to my next slide, if it'll allow me. Can you let me go? There we go. All right. So when I talk about empowerment, I want to give you a definition of what that means. And the definition that I found that I liked the most really just was very simple. And it says, enabling employees, and I added, and colleagues to take their take ownership of their work and contribute to meaningful decision making. And I think the key term in there is meaningful decision making, right? Not just the, you know, where are we going for lunch type of decisions, but really things that are powerful and impactful that drive business and really impact things day to day for the employees. And so when we talk about empowerment, we're gonna sort of get a, a synopsis of what that looks like. And what it looks like is encouraging open communication, right, as a leader and as a colleague. So if you are a leader and you have subordinates reporting to you, you are encouraging open communications with your colleagues and with folks who are reporting to you. And if you're a colleague, you're encouraging open communication with people that are your colleagues, as well as sort of up and down as, as you are able to, right? Um, and you're soliciting feedback from employees in a management role. Um, otherwise, you're soliciting feedback from colleagues and you're incorporating that into decision making, right? So you're not asking for people's thoughts and opinions. You're not surveying them and then completely disregarding what they've said, right? So one thing I say is if you are not going to act on feedback or act on people's opinions, then just don't ask them because they'll get very frustrated, especially in a work environment. Um, the third point, which is really important, is recognizing and celebrating individual and team achievements. Um, going further is allowing team members to make decisions autonomously, so not being a micromanager, but keeping it within defined parameters because there are certain things that team members can't be responsible for making decisions about, either because it's not their responsibility or it's just inappropriate for the level of their position or, or what the decisions are. Um, Next is creating a supportive environment where if there is failure, if people mess up, it is viewed as a learning opportunity and not just you know, a personal flaw against that individual. And then finally, it looks like providing resources and support to help colleagues overcome challenges. So if there are challenges, if they are struggling, there's resources, there's support to help them achieve their full potential. And so that's what it looks like. And then when we shift to what the benefits are, right? It's it's everything you would think of and then some things you might not necessarily think of. And so there was a study done by the Harvard Business Review that showed that empowering leaders are more likely to have employees that are rated by both their leader and their colleagues as being highly creative and good organizational citizens. So when I say a good organizational citizen, it means that the person is engaged, they go above and beyond when needed, and when we talk about engaged, you know, uh, an example of an employee that's engaged is if there's a piece of paper on the floor and they see it when they're walking by, they pick it up and they toss it, right, in the recycling or the trash or whatever, right? Someone who is disengaged 
would step over the piece of paper and keep going. And then someone who is like extremely di disengaged, like they are like one foot out the door, right? Because they're that disengaged. They are more likely to be the person that threw the piece of paper on the floor in the first place, right? Um, another benefit being higher productivity. So empowerment really aims to create an independent staff, independent employees, right? Involved in all this decision-making. And when they are empowered, they have higher rates of productivity because they are not waiting for the supervisors or the leaders permission to engage in problem solving, right? You have more motivated employees. And when you give your employees freedom to get creative and develop new ideas, um, it will improve their confidence and create a sense of accountability and make them more willing to put effort into their jobs, right? And then when we shift to talking about the customer service experience, I am of the firm belief that we all have customers in some way or another, no matter what kind of workplace you're in. So your customer might be your colleagues, right? If you're like a person in the training and development space, like I am, your customers might be actual customers. Your customers might be students. They might be patients. They could be any number of groups, but you have customers or stakeholders, if you want to sub in the word. And whenever you have an empowered workplace or an empowered work culture, you have an enhanced experience for that group of people. Um, and then when we talk about leadership, what's really interesting, um, and it's not new, but since the pandemic, it's been heightened, right? The, the trust between leadership and staff in any kind of environment can be really, really fragile. And it will plain vanish as soon as employees feel like they're being taken advantage of or taken for granted, right? So an empowering leadership style tackles this by making sure all team members know what the main goals are and that they are working hard and uh, working toward and actively contributing to shaping those goals, right? So not just knowing what they are, but they're contributing to what, what the goals are. And then they are delegated to along the way when we talked about autonomy earlier. And this reduction in dead time, right? There's a reduction in dead time. And you ask, what is dead time? Dead time is really time that is a waste of resources and time. And so when people are empowered, there's less dead time. There's less time that they're sitting there streaming videos instead of working. There's less time that they are working on things that are just going to be a waste of money and a waste of time because they are actively engaging with uh, the problems and creating innovative solutions. And then finally, you have a work culture that has been enriched where people take initiative and they uh, take action and propose solutions to problems and, and just really sort of hit the ground running um, whenever there's something involved. Now, I want to share a real world example. Right. You're probably going to chuckle on the other end of the spectrum when we talk about overpowering. But this um, and empowering leadership is really, really interesting. This company called HCL Tech, they used to be called HCL Technologies. Right. They're short, they've shortened their name. It's a global tech company. Um, and the CEO implemented this employees first, customers second model in 2005. And so at the time and I think even now it was considered a radical management philosophy, because when you think about corporations, um, even tech companies, a lot of them preach the customer is always right or customers first, right? We do things for our customers, right? They really turned that on its head and they said our employees are first, right? And so there were these different phases of their employee first and customer second um, journey. Um, and the first one was confronting the truth, right? So they started with confronting organizational issues head on. And then the next phase was using transparency to build trust. And so leaders were being very transparent about these issues, soliciting feedback and really trying to develop a plan to improve things at the organization for the employees and move forward, right? And very transparent about the goals of all of that. And then the interesting step that they took was inverting the management pyramid. So they turned the management structure upside down, right? And so in this new structure, the management is accountable to the employees, right? And then also it goes the other way around. So everybody is held accountable, but the management is accountable to the employees instead of the employees being accountable to management, right? And then they recast the office of the CEO. So they shifted responsibility of change from the CEO's office to employees, meaning that employees had this uh, what they called ideapreneurship effort, right? Where it's like you come up with the ideas, but then you own those ideas and you see them through, right? You get to tag your name to this idea 
and say that it's yours and you see it through until the end, right? So they let them think of new ideas, drive them to fruition, and really use a grassroots effort of solving problems, um, developing solutions, and in their customer-focused innovation, right? So there was a lot of um, ideating coming from the employees themselves, right? So they thought of new ideas and they and they really ran with them. And so the results of this drastic change with HCL Tech, and this company still exists, right? They made this shift in 2005, it still exists. So they have had an annual investment growth rate of 24%, right? It keeps growing and growing. They've doubled the number of customers that they have, right? They emerged as the top ranking IT services company in Forbes Asia's Fab 50 list. Again, this is a global company, so it's not just, you know, it's not U.S. based, but they do business in the U.S. Um, and it's ranked as one of the top six global services providers by Technology Partners International. And then they increased their per employee revenue. So each um, employee was bringing in more revenue than they had been done had been doing in years prior prior and so you really get to see this real world example of how you know being empowering in your leadership and creating a culture that is empowering can really drive business results and have significant impact when we go on the other end of the spectrum talking about overpowering what overpowering in the workplace and and really anywhere really is, is being dominating, being excessively assertive, right? So being assertive is fine, right? But being excessively so, right, when there's no need to be assertive or when you're just being really harsh and hard on someone, um, that's being excessively assertive, right? Being a micromanager. And this could be as a leader or as a colleague, right? Some people don't really understand that you can be a micromanager and not have anyone that you're managing. You can be working with colleagues at the same level as you or working with people above you and be micromanaging a process, right? So an overpowering individual or leadership style, they don't give their colleagues or their um, direct reports any independence. They really are over exerting their authority. Um, and what you'll notice in terms of what overpowerment looks like is that all of these things can be done whether you are a colleague or a manager or leader and you're actively supervising people, right? Um, so micromanagement, we just talked about that. Overpowering leadership or of uh, colleagues, they may exist, uh, exhibit these micromanagement tendencies. And that just involves excessively scrutinizing things, controlling every aspect of tasks or projects and undermining the autonomy and just really stifling the creativity in the, in the metaphorical room, right? With the teams. Um, there's authoritarian behavior. They, you know, adopt this very authoritarian leadership style, right? Dictating decisions without considering any input from others. And this leads to disempowerment and resentment amongst team members. Um, and then this is a lack of communication that they have because they fail to foster open communication channels by either dismissing feedback or dismissing ideas from others. And it results in a fear of a fear, a culture of fear, I'm sorry, or silence within any team or within the organizational as a whole, right? And then, you know, folks who are overpowering in their leadership style also disregard personal or professional boundaries, right? So they encroach on your autonomy or your workload, um, and they encroach often in your sort of personal space, um, and it can lead to feelings of frustration and resentment amongst colleagues or direct reports. So we talked about empowerment, right? And what a real world example looked like. The next example, you might chuckle a little bit, but it's really an example of what overpowering leadership looks like. So this is where we're talking about Theranos. Um, if you have been anywhere on the news, listening to podcasts, reading books, um, or watching Hulu, you might know about Theranos. So this was a consumer healthcare technology startup um, by uh, a person called Elizabeth Holmes, right? Um, she was a CEO that used the command and control model of leadership. So it was like her way or the highway, right? Um, she fostered a culture of fear in her organization. So she really questioned anyone who questioned things, they were systematically shut down and threatened and bullied and ignored. Uh, she and her other executives intentionally created silos and secrecy within the organization. So they they started setting things up so that 
you know, you can't have access to a certain floor in the building if you don't have a certain ID badge, right? And you can't know about this part of the project unless you have certain permission. And this person can't talk to this person about another piece of the project, all in an effort to keep people afraid, right? And then outright firing people when they started to ask questions and do things and, and having them sign these NDAs and things like that so they can't really go and, and talk about them publicly. There was also intense internal competitiveness, right? Pitting employees against one another, executives against one another, the scientists against one another. And what you noticed there was that there was a high attrition amongst their critical employees. So they're, they're experts, they're scientists. A lot of them were leaving because the management style was overpowering. And there was there was a reason that the management style was that way. But um, it, you know, no less illustrates that this type of leadership style is not going to get you what you want in terms of your goals. Right. And so the results of this, what happened with their notes, they lost their investors. Right. The company was shut down. Right. It was this, this all started, I think, back in 2014, 2015. They finally closed their doors in 2018. The CEO and the top executive were both convicted of numerous crimes, right? The company, CE, and, uh, the company and CEO are subject of numerous podcasts, documentaries, television shows, everything, right? So if you want to look into this, there's plenty of places you can. So this is an extreme example, right? These are extreme consequences. And many companies don't have this type of experience. In fact, I'd, I'd venture to say that most probably will not, right? So there will be companies where there's a lot of overpowering leadership and those companies will still thrive financially, right? So some examples are Amazon, Uber, right? It's notorious that Amazon has terrible work conditions, right? That they have terrible um, and unreasonable standards for their employees, right? Um, but they are still making money, right? So they're they're still getting the money. But the problems that they face in terms of their terrible workplace culture is that the employee experience tells a different story, right? So they might be financially successful, but the employee experience is suffering. And so what this is leading to is their reputation in the industry um, of being a bad place to work, right? So this may impact their ability to get employees, but it definitely impacts their ability to retain employees. And so retention, right, is the more important part than just recruitment because it usually costs about 1.5% a salary to, to, you know, one and a half times the salary to replace someone. So it's very, very, the cost can be very significant. So, you know, as with anything, um, too much of a good thing can be counterproductive, right? So just like there are risks of, you know, overpowering people, there are risks of over empowering people at an organization. So you want to make sure when you're empowering people, you're doing so to the benefit of, you know, the goals of the department, the organization, and to the benefit of the individual employees, right? So some of the risks of over empowering people will be like a loss of direction. So, you know, there'll be a lack of clarity in goals and goals um, and objectives, and the team may lose sight of their primary mission and be distracted by a lot of comp competing priorities. Another risk of over-empowering employees is a blurred chain of command. So you can create a situation where people don't know who to go to when something goes wrong, because it seems like everyone is sort of doing everything, right? Um, there's also a risk of an erosion of accountability. So if people are excessively empowered without any clear boundaries, accountability starts to diminish and people may shift blame or avoid taking responsibility for their actions. All of this is sort of the, at risk, right? And then you also have decision paralysis. I mean, I face this all the time, not because I'm empowered, just because there's too many decisions to make in a day. I was like, you mean I got to pick what I got to wear and I got to send a hundred emails and I got to talk to the staff person. I got to do this and do this. It's just too much, right? But too much empowerment without any guidance or structures can overwhelm people. And then they can be stuck in this decision paralysis where they struggle to make choices, right? Or take decisive action. And with a lot of industries, you need to be able to take quick quick action and move quickly. Um, disorganized efforts. So if there's no centralized leadership or coordination, it can lead to fragmented efforts, right? Causing work duplication, conflict, and a bunch of inefficiencies. And then the final one, which to me is the most important, is that it can cause increased job stress, right? So if you empower leaders to, I mean, if your leaders empower you too much, 
um, with additional responsibilities, it can cause the employees to have increased job stress because they're being given too much authority or too much to make decisions on. And it's not in line with what their goals are or what they envision their position to be. And so it creates more stress than it does alleviate stress. And so the goal is really to balance both empowerment and control, right? Because you need some control around some things, but the, the, the goal is to balance. And the way you go about doing that is building trust. And how do you build trust? You honor your commitments. You're transparent. You demonstrate integrity, right? You treat people um, equitably across all arenas, right? If someone gets, you know, sort of written up for this kind of procedure, the other person gets written up for the same kind of thing, right? If someone gets an award for doing this really well, then someone else will be nominated for award because they've done similar work, right? So you, you have that consistency. Um, you foster open, open communication. Um, I say communicate, 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 and encourage communication, right? Um, part of the problem is, is that people don't understand how communication works. So we think that communication works like this. I have a message to send. I tell you the message. Message is received. That is not how communication works. How it actually works is I have a message. I have all these filters, right? And the filters can be our relationship, the power structure, my goals, uh, my mood, anything, right? And then I send my message through those filters. And then there's the receiver on the other side. And they have their goals, their moods, the relationship, the power that they have. It goes through those filters. And then they hear a message. Is it the message you intended? It may not be. And so checking for understanding, right? Um, is really a part of that communication process. Um, most important, I would say, in addition to communication, is clarifying the expectations. You know, what are the roles and responsibilities of people? What do you expect? What do they expect? Are those things aligning, right? You wanna minimize confusion as much as possible because when people understand the expectations, they know the yardstick that they're being measured against. Encourage collaboration. So you want to encourage your team members to seek input from others, leverage people's strengths. So work with people who have different strengths than they do and work together towards common goals. So for example, I'm a really good logistical person. Um, I'm not always great at like the big vision. And so I work really well with visionaries because I can ground their vision and help them execute, right? So it's important to encourage that collaboration so that people are really uh, maximizing their strengths. Um, providing support and resources that will help colleagues succeed, especially if there are like performance issues and people need to be sort of brought up to a certain standard. Celebrating successes. I mentioned this earlier. You know, recognize and celebrate individual and team achievements. However, celebration goes for you, for your organization, your group, even if it's a volunteer organization like this. However, you know, success is celebrated, you take time to do that. Um, holding people accountable while providing support and guidance with needed. So holding people accountable is not just saying you said you would do X, Y, Z and you didn't do X, Y, Z. It's really like, hey, our understanding was that you were going to handle this. What happened? What got in the way? How can we make sure this doesn't happen again? Right. Sort of using it as a teaching moment instead of as like a failing moment. And then the final thing is to adapt. So if COVID taught us anything is that we have to continually assess and adjust, right? And so we need to do that with our empowerment and control balancing, right? We have to adjust based on feedback that we're getting from others and based on the outcomes that we're seeing. Um, so all of these things are things that you can actively do to proactively balance um, empowerment and control. So this wraps up the the me talking at you part uh, and really opens it up for you to ask questions, for you to share comments. Um, anything resonates with you, anything doesn't resonate and you want to talk more about it. Um, it really is open and I'll try to open my chat to see if I see anything in the chat as well. <clears throat> so far, no, just Mallory's comment that the um, Theranos lady was scary. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And I will tell you, I read the book Bad Blood when it came out. I listened to the podcast. I watched the Hulu series and documentaries, um, everything. I followed that case very closely. Um, so, yeah, so far we have no comments in the chat, but I will say thank you, Tanisha, for that. I 
definitely could recall some experiences when I worked for other people um, where there was some over empowerment or not over empowerment, over controlling behaviors. I um, mean, I'm thankful to not work with them anymore. Yeah. Uh, all right. I do see actually a question here in the chat. Could you share some strategies for setting boundaries with a micromanager without causing friction or backlash? That is a great question. And so what I would say is get clear on your goal first, right? I This is where I start everything. What is your goal? Okay, so the goal in setting the boundary is what, right? Is it to stop them from like coming against personal boundaries, right? That are to your person. Is it to create more of a relationship where you have more autonomy over, over your work? Like talk about the goal first, right? It, with yourself, not with the other person. And then what I would really do is express to that manager or that colleague, hey, this is the goal that I'm trying to achieve, right? So if my goal is to have more autonomy in my work because, you know, I actually work better with more autonomy, I would say, hey, I work better when I have more autonomy. I notice, right? And then label what you notice, but label it objectively. You're just labeling the actions. You're not adding any judgment. And here's what I mean. You can say, I notice that every time we have a project, you send me numerous emails um, asking me questions about the project before the first deadline, right? And so what you're doing there is just stating the facts. Now, if you added judgment to that, it would say, you know what, you keep emailing me before deadlines are even due. Like you're really, it's like you're really impatient or you don't think I know what I'm doing. Why are you, why do you continue to email me, right? That's adding judgment. You really want to state the objective facts is I notice you're emailing me multiple times before the deadline comes. Here's how I work. I work better with more autonomy when I have the time and space to complete my project and then maybe an informal check-in. It seems like your style may be a little different. How can we work together so that you get what you need and I am able to retain a little bit of that autonomy so that I can do the best job that I can do? So that's yeah. the, the strategy that I would recommend there. And I will say that it doesn't mean that the person will be cooperative, right? Because sometimes people are just not cooperative. So I, mm -hmm. I like to put that out, out there. Mm -hmm. But I think that most people want to do a good job and want to work together with people. And for those, you can try to figure out some sort of alignment where you guys can meet somewhere, even if it's not in the middle, but where you can meet somewhere where there's some collaboration happening. That's a great answer, Tanisha. I definitely um, employ and teach that same concept of what's the end goal here? What are, what are we hoping to accomplish um, we had quite a few questions pop up. Okay, so the next one is, how does this em empowerment fit with remote work versus in-person work? So is there a difference in dynamics? I think there is. So I'm pretty sure that you ladies have heard or read about on the news companies that are using like tracking software for their remote employees mm -hmm. to make sure they're working, right? And then the mm -hmm. employees are, as a caveat, downloading like mouse clicking software that shifts the, that mm. makes it appears like their mouse is shifting every few minutes or whatever, right? So I think the way it can play out in remote environments in terms of uh, overpowering is just being excessively micromanaging with your people, right? Here's what I like to say. I like to say there's a myth that goes around that people say, I treat everybody the same, right? And I like to say that is a myth. Nobody treats everybody the same, right? I don't treat my brothers the same. I have different relationships with each brother. I, One of the brothers, we joke and laugh all the time. The other one is a very serious person. We don't joke, we don't laugh, right? So you meet people where they are. If you have employees that require more um, hands-on, right, in terms of your management style, more touch points, then you have more touch points with that person within reason and you work together to figure out what that that is, right? But if you have other employees or team members who are more autonomous and they just go and they only need to check in with you once a week or something, then that's what you do with that person. And you explain, I'm going to meet everybody where they are, right? So everybody might not need the, the team's check-in every single day. Some people might need just that touch point once a week, right? So you empower them by giving them what they need and communicating with them about what their needs are. In terms of in-person work, 
it's the same thing, but it's just a different, it's just a different beast, right? So are you hovering over someone's desk? Are you, you know, asking, hey, I just, I just called you on your phone. You didn't pick it up. You know, you're in one office, they're in the other. Why didn't you pick up the phone? Or, oh, I thought you had a meeting at such and such. Why aren't you in the meet? Like, if there's that, that is, you know, micromanaging, right? And the way to mitigate that is, is to just sort of, like I said, come together and explain what the goals and expectations are. And then, Leave people to achieve those expectations. Assume that they will. And if they don't, then you step in to say, okay, hey, I'm noticing something is going on. How can we work together to solve this? Does that answer your question? Uh, I'm sorry. Who that was, was Mindy, Mindy that asked that question. Does that answer your question, Mindy? It sounds like uh, the key principle really is checking in, saying, how can I support you as your supervisor? Yes. Yeah, I I, um, I, I was curious because I... I I'm older, so I worked in a, an office where we were in person, and I um, I do a lot of volunteer work and other kinds of things now. And the remote really throws me because I don't feel like I got the high touch or we have those connections on a, an informal basis to be able to build um, much of a re relationship. So I think the more you know who you're working with, the better it is. Right. And so to build those relationships, I would reach out, I would proactively reach out to people and say, hey, we work in this virtual way. I noticed that we don't know each other very well. I would really like to get to know you a little better. What's the best way for me to approach that? Or what's the, what's the best way that we can do that? Right. And you can offer ideas, but don't be married to them. You can say, can we do a 15 minute coffee chat on Zoom? Or can we have a, a 30 minute lunch over Zoom? Or can we get together for lunch if that's an option? I'm not sure how close you are to these people. But I would, I would say I'm actively trying to get to know you because I really enjoy working with this organization and the people. And I notice I don't know you very well. I, I would like to get to know you. How can we make that happen? And give people an opportunity to tell you what's the best way they can get to know you. And sometimes um, people might not want to, and that means nothing about you as a person that you're smelly or anything like that. It's just their personality style. They might up, Jenny. I might be a little, I went to the gym <laughs> earlier. I might be a little. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Um, next question uh, from Nancy. Can you speak about the challenges of creating an empowerment culture as a woman in a multi-generational workplace? Ooh, I'm curious about that. So I, I actually was talking about a multi-generational workplace today and um, uh, last week when I was on this panel for Black History Month. And I think that the number one thing that people have to do in a multi-generational workplace is stop listening to the stereotypes mm. investigate your beliefs about generations right whether it's the generation you are in or a generation you are not in investigate your beliefs about this i read this piece in in harvard business review that that said um you know there's you know this is the silent generation the boomers are this generation and the millennials are you know lazy and expected whatever da, da, da. and it said these are all stereotypes as with any stereotype, it's inherently false because people are different and they're all individuals, right? So just like I cannot represent all of you women on this call, one boomer, one millennial, one Gen Xer cannot represent their entire generation, right? While there may be some um, values that seem to be cropping up, right? And some behaviors that seem to be cropping up, I would be careful to not ascribe that to the entire generation, right? And so a lot of the times when we are having trouble working in a multi-generational workforce, it is because we are coming with a preconceived notion in our minds about what this what this um, generation is about. And then we get confirmation bias because we look for examples of what we already know. Now, I'll give you an example. So if I'm a person that is um, from a millennial generation, Maybe I'm like, oh, boomers, they think you're supposed to work late all the time and they think they know everything, blah, 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 blah. And I, and I have these stereotypes in my head, right? I'm not going to notice when there are plenty of people in that age group not doing that. I'm mm -hmm. going to notice the one person that does do that. And I'm going to say, see, they all do it. 
They all do it, right? I'm not going to notice when people are being collaborative and everything. So I really encourage people to have their experiences with the individuals and not with the generation, if that makes sense. We're getting a couple kind of amens to that in the comments, um, because absolutely right. There's that that creates an us versus them um, exactly. kind of thinking. And that is not collaboration. That is segregation. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's see. The next one is from Samantha. Thank you, Tanisha. How does one try to determine if the workplace culture is empowering or disempowering when job searching? Are some industries more prone to this, like education, et cetera? Um, I think sometimes some some industries can be more prone to it. But as I said, with stereotypes, there's there's different, you know, organizations that you can have um, and, and ways to go about things. So um, I would say I would ask questions to the people you are being interviewed with, especially if they are your prospective managers. Right. I would ask them. What is your management style, right? And a lot of people have trouble with that question. What I would say is, you know, do you, are you the type of person that, you know, just gives people their goals and say, you know, you go ahead and you check in if you need it? Or are you someone who needs a lot of touch points, right? You don't want to say, are you a micromanager? But you want to say, are you somebody who needs a lot of touch points and a lot of communication and you want to be talked to frequently and every day? And I would say, what about the team, right? How, how does the team communicate regularly, Right. Is it something that, oh, we just talk when we need to? Is there a weekly meeting? And what are those weekly meetings like, right? What's expected at those meetings? I would ask these higher elevated questions as you get to second and third interview. But in first interviews, you really want to ask questions about their leadership style and how they would describe the culture of a company, right? And I would say, I would also ask, how do you think your employees describe the culture, right? Because a lot of times management has one idea, but when they think about it from an employee's perspective, it's different. And, you know, I would say, you know, what's your turnover like, you know, is mm -hmm. it industry standard or is it higher, right? And why do you think it's higher if it is, right? Because what people need to understand is, you know, you're interviewing them to see if you want to be of their part of organization and they're interviewing you. So there's a give and take, right? You come to the interview with equal footing. And I think sometimes as a job seeker, we come to an interview and we think we are a, a lower footing. And so we ask mm -hmm. our one or two questions and we get out of there. No, we're an equal footing because guess what? If they want to hire you, you've earned that job. They pay you for a service. You do the service, they pay you equal footing. They are not above you. So you come in there with your uh, confidence, as it were, or your curiosity to learn more about the organization. That's a great reminder about being on equal footing, because I can remember my job searching days and not feel and feeling that power differential between the interviewer and me. Um, so I like that that encouragement. Um, the next question you may have already answered, but I'll ask it and I'll ask Lori if she feels like you've answered already is what are some red flags during the job interview process that might indicate a company or manager is prone to micromanaging? I would say an onerous interview process, right? <laughs> Just de depending on what kind of level job it is, right? I've heard people being invited on four interviews for like a coordinator job. No. I'm not doing that. I mean, like to each their own. But if the job is not at a level where that level of touch point and, and it's not you're not going to the Secret Service, you know what I'm saying? Like if you're going to like some top government thing, there might be more of that involved. Mm -hmm. But if you're just applying for a standard industry job and they're like, oh, you got to do a project. Oh, you got to like you I can take your assessment. I can do this. You have to do a project. You got to come in and interview with this person. You got to go interview with that person. You got to. And if they're not paying you to come and do all of this, that is a red flag to me. That is a red flag to me. I would also, for me, and this is just my personal opinion, a red flag is when people say we're like family mm. because I just work here. I may love my work um, and I may love you all as colleagues, but this is not my family. Sometimes that is a hint that we expect you to be available right? More than you might be willing to because we are family, right? So some of those things are red flags to me, but I think people have to decide for themselves what the red flags are. Excellent. Uh, let's see the next one. Um, also from Lori, in your experience, what are the long-term effects of working under a micromanager on an employee's mental health and productivity? 
um, they can be very significant. So I have a coaching client um, that I am coaching that started to have panic attacks after working in, with an overpowering um, manager. And she actually just realized when we started coaching that part of the reason the manager was this way to her was because she was female. She worked in a male dominated industry. She was the only female at the company. Mm. Um, and when she started getting feedback from him, initially it was just really harsh feedback. Right. And then after a while, it was like cursing at her and this is BS and blah, blah, blah. To the point where twice she had a panic attack and passed out. Wow. So she eventually left that job, but the lingering impacts on her is that she has a decreased level of confidence. Mm -hmm. And so she now runs all of her emails and, and ideas through checks with colleagues at this new place to see if they think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, she sought counseling, right? So she sees a counselor and she's working through things, but it has had a tremendous impact on her. Yeah. Right. So I think depending on how severe it is, it can have a significant impact on your life. I work somewhere where I had I had an overpowering manager. I had a two year old daughter at the time and I left work with a pit in my stomach every single day until I left that place. So I think it also can manifest in physical illness in mm -hmm. addition to mental health challenges. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, speaking as a therapist, very well documented that our mental and emotional stress can manifest physically, especially if we don't tend to it um, before it, it grows bigger and bigger. So, um, and I, I can speak to, you know, having clients that have some overpowering managers and it does take that, that toll on their self-esteem and that's not great for any work environment. Um, okay. So we had the thank yous about the stereotypes. Okay. Next question from Anne Marie, what do you like most about what you do or what have you been surprised by when working with clients? Um, that's a great question. I, I love seeing people start one way and then depart in a completely different way when mm -hmm. we're done working together. I think that is my favorite thing, right? Whatever it is that they've learned and that they've gained, right? It's, I don't have, I, I mean, I might have an idea of like, oh, this is my, might be where it ends up. And a lot of times it doesn't end up that way, but where it ends up is so much better for them, right? And it's so important for their development and what they're doing. And I think the thing that I've been surprised most about is the level of dynamic, educated, smart, innovative people that I work with that all experience some level of imposter syndrome I mean, from VP of some organization on down, right? It is everywhere. And that to me says that we have a, a problem in our culture, I think, um, writ large in our society about what the expectations of our professionals in these various arenas, um, because there is not one single person that I have talked to that have just been like, oh, I've got it. I'm great. Like, I'm confident. Like, everybody has been like, I feel like I don't belong or I feel like, you know, something's wrong. Or I'm not saying the right thing or I'm not doing the right thing. There's not a person I've worked with who has felt completely confident in their capabilities, despite evidence of the contrary. Mm -hmm. um, that growth is a great thing to see that, you know, getting to that point when you said where you start and where, where they kind of launch from when they finish working with you. Okay. And then the last question we have so far is, um, and probably the last one for this evening before we wrap up is, uh, from, um, Menciona. And I sincerely hope I pronounced her name correctly. How would you go about asking the leadership for more on the job education? So what I would do is ask, uh, what do they do to uh, develop their employees? And you can ask, is there you know, are there mentorship programs? You know, are is there coaching there? Um, do you, you know, give people special projects to learn different skills? I would really ask them about their development of their employees and what they do. Do they sponsor people to go to conferences and different trainings externally? Do they handle it all internally? And I would, as a prospective job seeker, figure out 
whether I want a place that handles things internally or has a mix, you know, does things externally, internally. Um, but I definitely would ask them, you know, how do you develop your employees? And and I would ask them about, depending on what level, I would ask them about that for your level of employee. But in addition to that, I would ask about anybody who's on the front line and anybody who is a supervisor or a leader, because some companies stop the development process with a certain level of leadership. And it's not that they intentionally do it. They just kind of feel like, oh, those people know what they're doing and they they don't invest as much. Um, and then some don't invest in frontline because it's too expensive because frontline means they're hourly, right? And you have to take them off whatever hourly thing and pay them for to go into training. But to me, if if you are investing in your hourly workers, then you really care about development overall, which means that you're likely to care about my development. So that's how I, I like to ask. So that would be in the interview process and asking, what if you've already been with the company for a little while and now you want to learn a new, get a new certificate in something? How would you approach that? Oh, this this is what I do is I do my research, right? I say, hey, this is the thing I'm interested in. It always has to be related to your job, by the way, or something you're striving for in your job. Because <laughs> if it's unrelated, they're not going to pay for it. They're just not. <laughs> so I would research what it is I want to do. Um, and what I do is I prepare a case. I prepare a case of how this would benefit me and my professional goals and how it would benefit the organization. Mm. Um, and I would say, hey, uh, and I would also ask HR because HR usually has like a policy around these things. But for some organizations, it's unclear. So if it's unclear, I would prepare my case. Um, I would talk to my direct supervisors and say, hey, look, I've checked with HR. There doesn't seem to be a firm policy around this. But here's what I would like to do. I would like to go to this certificate training program in project management, for example. And here's why. Here's how it will benefit the organization. Um, I will be able to better lead these projects. Um, I will be able to close projects on time. Um, I'll be able to manage multiple projects. You know, like whatever the the benefits are, you rattle those off, Right. And I would do this in a meeting. I would not prepare them for the meeting. I would say, hey, can I meet with you in 15 minutes? I would not tell them what it's about. I would just say, oh, I just want to check in. Because in these types of situations, if you give them advance notice and they know they don't want to pay for it, they'll come up with their reason to say no already. But if you don't tell them, then you can come to them and say, here's what I want to do. Here's why it will be great for the organization. Here's why it will be great for my growth within the organization. And I would say, I always would leave the meeting in a question mark. I would say, could you check into this for me? Could you check into how this would be possible? I would not say, what is the process or how can I get, could you check into this for me? Because what you're saying to them is that, hey, you might not be the final authority on this, but I recognize your role as my supervisor and I'd like you to check into this. Great answer. Um... And we've got several comments here saying thank you and how they thought that this was going to apply mostly for people looking for jobs, but they've been able to see how it applies to people across the spectrum from growing a company to retirees to having been with a company for a while. And I, I definitely agree with that, even as a, a single person um, business owner, um, just working for myself, I'm like, oh, I can I'm looking to hire my first person or even how I can empower myself as a single business owner. Um, so I can definitely echo those comments as well. And so I know Lori posted in the chat that um, some of these comments, if you would like to please leave a word or um, phrase of something that you might be taking uh, home for, um, from this lesson, lesson, this talk <laughs> uh, today, and that the AAC may use uh, your comments for marketing purposes. So um, yeah, any, uh, final comments here. I think, um, Lori, you wanted to share some upcoming events um, to close us out. Yes. Um, and Tanisha, thank you so much. This was amazing. And um, it's actually, I mean, everyone on, thank you for coming. And um, I know it's even going to help people after this because we'll be um, adding it to our YouTube channel. So, you know, anybody who missed it can come on and see it. Um, and I thank you so much and thank you everyone for being here. I just wanted to um, go over a couple of things quickly. Um, I just want everyone to know that there is money available for fellowships. 
Um, the deadline is coming up very, very soon for alumni. Um, the deadline is March 1st. Um, and then for students, it's June 3rd. And so money is available for fellowships. Um, you can get in touch with Susan Wallace um, at the AADC and uh, she can, you know, help you out with, or go on our, visit our website and get the application there. Um, and then some upcoming events, um, especially in March, we have the VDS Vision Board Party, um, and that's in person at the cottage in New Brunswick. Uh, registration is online. I'm going to put um, links in the chat as soon as I stop sharing. Um, but uh, it's it's a lot of fun. You can bring an old vision board if you want to continue it, at, um, you know, and just keep going or start a new one. Um, and that's March 16th from 1 to 3. And then we have the Zagorin lecture coming up on March 21st. Um, and that's with Whitney Pennington Rogers, a class of 07, rising above the noise, disrupting communication in a distracted, divided world. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, and then uh, there's some more upcoming events here, Black Alumni Network, virtual general body meeting, um, Pride, the power of pets um, is coming up and um, that's virtual as well. And then also reunion registration is live and on the website, I'll put the link in there. Um, it's the second week of June this year. So June 7th and 8th. Um, and remember to connect with us on uh, our website and social media platforms. Our handle is douglasalumni.org. Um, and I just have this one more slide to share about the impact, um, experiencing the impact of the AEDC community um, and uh, the ways to give there on our website. And we appreciate all of you. And Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the evening. I'm going to put those links in the chat. Um, so if anyone wants to register uh, for upcoming events or reunion, just um, hang on, and I'll put those in in a second. And otherwise, thank you so much, and thank you, Tanisha, and thank you, Jenny. It was a, it was an amazing program, and um, I'm so grateful. Thank you. And here they are. Okay. Thanks, Tanisha. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night. Good night. Good night, everyone. And um, I'll just keep this on for anyone for a couple of minutes if you want to go in the chat and use the link. We're good. Mm -hmm. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hey. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat>